Forgotten prophecies are buried in the Feast of Tabernacles rituals. They're ancient rituals. Christians need to realize this now. Now, most Christians do realize the fall feasts of the Lord have prophetic importance. Feast of Trumpets, almost everyone sees a link there. Yom Kippur, some see the parallels. But the Feast of Tabernacles, everyone seems to just not give it much thought. But there is a lot of forgotten and buried prophecies in that feast, and many will happen sooner than we think, maybe in our lifetimes. Tabernacles, or Sukkot, was one of the three festivals in the Old Testament where every Jewish man had to go to Jerusalem. While there, they would live in these temporary, relatively flimsy booths for a week. For a week. Let that sink in. That should catch your attention. Looking at this prophetically, if we do a day for a year substitution, that might mean a seven-year week of years. So is there a parallel to the 70th week of Daniel and the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, right off the bat, there is. The Feast of Tabernacles in the Old Testament celebrates two things, the harvest or in-gathering, That certainly has end time meaning. And the exodus from Egypt where the Hebrews wandered in the desert for 40 years. 40, of course, being the number of repentance and testing. And when will God's people leave their homes and go to live in flimsy booths and experience a time of testing and repentance? Huh, during the tribulation. Yeah, right. So the Feast of Tabernacles is a picture, in some ways, of the tribulation especially the last half, when those living in Judah will have to flee to the wilderness mountains and live in booths as per Matthew 24, 15 through 16 and Revelation 12, 13 through 14. This is also parallel to those wandering in the desert for 40 years who lived in tents and temporary structures after the Exodus. So Sukkot or Tabernacles is yearly practice that God is giving us now for what is coming. If you practice living in a tent or temporary structure at least once a year, you are so much better prepared for what lies ahead. So how many of you, or how many churches that you know, spend this coming week in a sukkah or a little tent? I imagine very few realize the practical nature of this festival. Living in a tent is also a picture of what occurs if a day equals a thousand years, when the tent is symbolic of our earthly body that we live in. Humans will live in these temporary structures that we call human bodies over the course of the 7,000 years from the fall of man until the end of the millennial kingdom. Then God will usher in the eternal state when everybody will be in resurrection bodies. Understand that although Christians will be in resurrection bodies after the resurrection, the living survivors of the tribulation will not be. They will still live in the tents of their earthly bodies even during the millennium. And this Feast of Tabernacles not only has seven days, it also includes an eighth day, the great day that mimics the eternal state after the millennial kingdom when everyone who enters the eternal kingdom, will be in resurrection bodies. See what a great picture this is? Well, what if tabernacles is just what it says it is, a feast where a day equals a day? (laughs) Imagine that, that it could mean what it actually says. What does it signify at its base meaning? A seven-day feast. Well, Jewish weddings were seven days long, and they involved a chuppah, or a tabernacle. Weddings took place under these tents. Revelation 7, 9, 15 speaks of this in heaven. After these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude no one could count from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. Palm branches are a symbol of the Feast of Tabernacles, by the way. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle, or chuppah, over them. So, 
these resurrected and raptured saints in heaven are getting ready for tabernacles. They're getting ready for the wedding to take place. Notice it said he will spread his tabernacle over them. He hasn't done that yet. Revelation 19 speaks of this future wedding also. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad. Tabernacles, by the way, is the one feast where we're absolutely commanded to rejoice and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen are the righteous acts of the saints. Revelation 19, 6 through 8. Now there's all kind of controversy about when the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. I know that. But this passage in Revelation 19 and the passage we just read in Revelation 7 really nail it. The verb tenses there nail it. Did you notice them? Revelation 7 said God will spread his hoppa over them. Future tense. Since this happens after the sixth seal and after the beginning of the great tribulation, it is at least future to those things. In Revelation 19, it says the marriage of a lamb has come or has begun, meaning a present tense, not a past tense. In context, the people who are crying out the great multitude say that Babylon has been destroyed and they're thankful for that and that God is reigning. So it seems likely that this is after the seventh trumpet when Jesus begins to reign, as we're told. Now remember, this is not proof of rapture timing. It doesn't eliminate any of the theories. But it does disprove the very popular idea that the wedding feast of the Lamb takes place for all seven years of the tribulation while saints are in heaven after a pre-trib rapture. It doesn't disprove the pre-trib rapture, but it does disprove the idea that the marriage feast occurs prior to the end of a tribulation. You should make a note of that, maybe a little asterisk in your Bible, right there in Revelation 19. So if you've been using the marriage supper of the Lamb as some kind of pseudo-proof for rapture timing, like in the movie Before the Wrath, which does that, it's probably time to stop using that proof because as you can see, the Bible is very clear. The wedding supper of the Lamb takes place after the sixth seal, at least after the beginning of the Great Tribulation and at the point in Revelation 19 where Jesus is about ready to come back to earth. It still is just about to happen at that point. I bet almost everyone listening just learned something that they didn't know before. And that's why you watch this channel. This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters, and we are thrilled that you've joined us. And we would like you to join us for all the videos that we do. Just hit the subscribe button down below this video and join us as a community. Now, I bet you'd like to know when I think the wedding supper of the Lamb does take place. So let's get back to it. So in fact, based on its position in the order of the Feast of the Lord, first there's the Feast of Trumpets, then there's Yom Kippur, which is Judgment Day or the Battle of Armageddon, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, it makes a lot more sense that it occurs on the earth after Jesus has already returned to fight Armageddon, which almost assuredly, as we said, happens on Yom Kippur. Isaiah 25, 6-8 might speak of this feast. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which has been over all people, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. If this is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I sort of suspect it is, it would mean that Jesus holds it on the earth, not in heaven, 
Notice it's taking place on the mountains of Israel. And only after all of God's people have been gathered, those who were gathered into heaven at Christ's coming, and also all those who were left behind, endured the wrath of God on the earth and came to faith at the end. Now this would include the nation of Israel saved at the end. And I would think Jesus would want to include them in the wedding feast, don't you? And this inclusion just makes sense for me. At least that God would wait for everyone to be gathered together before holding that marriage feast. Doesn't that make sense to you as well? Now, there are other significant aspects to the Feast of Tabernacles. Did you know Jesus celebrated it? It's recorded for us in John 7, verses 2 and 10. Now, the Feast of the Jews, the Feast of Booths, which is another name for the Feast of Tabernacles, was near. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, but not publicly, but as if in secret. And while Jesus was there, on the last day of the feast, there was a ceremony, a water-pouring ceremony, which started in the pool of Siloam. Priests would draw the water out into these vessels, carry them up to the temple, and then pour it out on the altar on the temple grounds. This was done to mark the significance of rain and for their gratitude in receiving rain from the Lord. The pouring was celebrated with lots of fanfare, and it occurred every evening during Sukkot. Great torch lights illuminated the area of the temple, and there was some festival-type atmosphere with singing, dancing, performing. And just about everyone was there, including Jesus. John 7, 37-38 tells us Jesus used this occasion as a teaching moment. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus was speaking of the Holy Spirit that comes as early and latter rains as per James 5, 7. Remember, this was a prayer for rain. It was a rain ceremony, so to speak. The spirit he poured out on Pentecost, the first century, or the early rains, and the pouring out of the spirit in the end times, or the latter rains. Joel 2.28 speaks prophetically of this end time outpouring. I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men, like me, will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. So there will be a pouring out. Notice the water image of the Holy Spirit in the end times prior to the day of the Lord, as we see in Joel. And of course, this pouring out is symbolic of the actual rivers that are going to flow out of the temple in the millennial kingdom to the Dead Sea, making the salt water fresh that we learn about in the book of Ezekiel. And on the banks of that river are going to be the tree of life with 12 fruits and leaves for healing. That's where Revelation gets that. This focus on rain also makes me think of two other end-time prophecies that focus on rain. First, the two witnesses are going to stop the rain for all 1260 days of their ministry, sort of like Elijah did. Does this start on a Feast of Tabernacles? Kind of like a sign that God is displeased with Israel, since rain was an important part of the ceremonies of the feast. Now, it's just a guess. But maybe that's what happens. I did a little test to see if it would work. If the witnesses ended the rain on the last great day of the feast, sort of like the same day that Jesus cried out, and that happened in 2024, a year that we're thinking could be the beginning of the tribulation, and if their ministry lasted 1260 days, as it says, it would end three and a half days prior to Passover of 2028. Three and a half days, by the way, is the length of time the two witnesses lay dead in the streets after the Antichrist kills them. Then this period would be, as we said, exactly 1260 days. <laughs> I'm just saying. This is easily tested, by the way, 
by watching what happens on the Feast of Tabernacles 2024. It may happen. It may not happen. This is just a guess on our part, but it's something to really watch for, especially if rain stops falling in the Middle East. The second thing, which unlike the witnesses is absolutely guaranteed to happen, is associated with the Feast of Tabernacles as well. And that is found in Zechariah 14, 18 through 19. In the Millennial Kingdom, all nations will be required to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the feast there. And the punishment, if they don't, is there will be no rain. Again, it's associated with rain. Now, let's go back to Jesus and the time that he spent celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem that year that was recorded. The very next day, after Jesus attended the water ceremony, probably in relation to the torches that were lit at the ceremony as well, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. How appropriate. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12. So two of Jesus' most famous statements, that springs of living water will come out of people and that he's the light of life, these famous statements were made on the Feast of Tabernacles. How about that? So you may not have considered it, but the feasts actually interact with each other as well. And the way they interact is important to know what prophecies are associated with each feast and how they're going to interact. So we need to know about the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur as well, since these are all happening at about the same time. Click right here to discover how prophecy might be fulfilled on the Feast of Trumpets. And over here to discover how Yom Kippur will be Judgment Day. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there or over here.